Hello and welcome to the AP World History Podcast. This is episode 17, Early Modern Empires. So our time period is 1450 to 1750, and like the other units, we have some new empires in this unit. But what's more important is that we have a new type of empire, and these are the global empires that were built by Western European powers during the period. So up until the early modern era, all the great empires that we've looked at so far, Rome, Greece, China, Persia, um, the Islamic empires, even the massive Mongol empire, they've all been regional empires, and this means that they're all confined to one section of the world map. They begin from a heartland, and from that heartland, they grow and take over territory around the heartland, or take over the surrounding territory. In the early modern era, the powerful European states like France, Britain, Portugal, Spain, the Netherlands, they all wanted their own empires. The problem for them was that they were surrounded by equally powerful countries. So their goal was empire, but a regional empire wasn't possible. So what these countries did instead is turn to the ocean and try to find colonies that are going to be profitable in places like America and later Africa, South Asia, Australia, uh, and so on. So Columbus came to America in 1492 representing Spain. Eventually the Spanish would conquer both the Aztecs and the Incas. A little bit later the Portuguese came to Brazil and established colonies there. And by the early 1600s, The British, French, Dutch, they're all sending out maritime expeditions to find colonies in America. By the middle of the 1700s, Europeans own most of America. So the first big picture question I'm going to address is, why were Europeans successful at conquering America? So to answer that question, we have to go back and ask ourselves, why Europe and why not China? who up until this point in world history, they've been richer and more technologically advanced than Europe. For starters, Europeans had a geographic advantage because they were closer. And it's not a coincidence that the European countries that came to America uh, were the ones that were bordering the Atlantic Ocean. So Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, these countries were all closer to the Americas than China or uh, the Islamic world. But more importantly, Europeans had much more motivation to venture out of Europe. So trade in the Indian Ocean was really where it was at. And Chinese sailors, Indian sailors, Muslim sailors, they didn't really have a reason for looking too far. There were already major players in uh, the world's most profitable trade. So Europeans could see this from afar and they were upset that they weren't a part of it and they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to get into these rich markets of India and China. The big problem accessing these markets was that between Western Europe and the Orient, you had the Ottoman Empire. And if you wanted to take a trading caravan through the Ottoman Empire, you were going to get taxed uh, really heavily. So Europeans wanted to get rid of Muslim middlemen in the Ottoman Empire, and the only way to do that was to go by sea. So it's important for us to remember the story of Zhang He. His ships were much more advanced than Europeans, and he traveled all over the Indian Ocean Trade Network. Uh, He had the technology to make it to America, and he probably could have made it to America, but his voyages were eventually shut down by the Chinese Emperor, uh, and the Emperor decided that they weren't going to pursue maritime expeditions anymore. Um, uh, Part of that is, is the belief that China was the Middle Kingdom. If anything outside of China was worth having, someone would bring it to them. So when China decided they were going to stop uh, the maritime expeditions, that ended expeditions for all of China. And this is where China's unity, which had long been its advantage in world history, backfires, and Europe's disunity or political fragmentation becomes an advantage. So we just looked at some of the big reasons why Europeans were the ones to come to America as opposed to the Chinese. 
and we're setting ourselves up for this major encounter between indigenous Americans and Europeans, and we want to try to understand the impact that Europeans had on indigenous people. There's some debate, but the general scientific consensus is that there were between 60 and 80 million people in America when Europeans first came, and that's roughly the population of Europe at that time. In the post-classical era, we looked at the Aztec and Inca empires, and these empires ruled the most densely populated parts of America. One thing that we want to keep in mind is that Europe and really all Africa and Eurasia had this long history of animal domestication, and people lived near their animals, and a lot of our most infectious diseases throughout history came from interacting and living near animals. So over time, people in Eurasia and Africa developed immunities to these diseases, but they're still very devastating for everybody. So 1492, this isn't too long after the plague killed about a third of the population of both Europe and China. The important thing to understand is that Americas were isolated for a long time from Eurasia, so people didn't have an opportunity to develop immunities to smallpox and measles and typhus, influenza, uh, malaria, and uh, yellow fever, among others. So, when Christopher Columbus first landed on Caribbean islands, within 50 years, indigenous people on the islands had disappeared. Mesoamerica, which was uh, the land of the Aztecs, had a population of between 10 and 20 million people when Europeans arrived, and this number dropped to about 1 million in a little over 100 years. And similar things happened in South America and North America, and some of this population collapse was because of war, but the majority of it was because of disease, because of the diseases that Europeans brought over. So it's really impossible to understate the impact of disease on indigenous people. Uh, some estimates go as high as 90% of the indigenous population died because of uh, the European disease. Um, one historian called it the greatest single tragedy uh, in our history. So on top of disease, Europeans also brought plants and animals, and these were the crops and animals that Europeans had acquired over many years. Uh, so for crops, wheat, rice, sugarcane, grapes for wine, different vegetables and fruits, these all became part of the American agricultural economy. Domesticated animals really changed America as well. So domesticated animals were brought over, horses, pigs, cattle, goats, sheep, and the population of these animals in America exploded because they didn't have any natural predators. At the same time, American food crops went the other way to Europe and Africa and Asia, and American food crops helped create population growth in uh, Europe, in Africa, in China. Uh, the population in Europe, for example, grew from 60 million in 1490 to 390 million in 1900, and this growth was really driven by American crops, especially the potato. So, looking at trade networks, we've talked about the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean Basin and the Trans-Saharan trade. Uh, the term for this new exchange, this new network of communication across the Atlantic Ocean, is the Columbian Exchange. Columbian Exchange, you'll read about and hear a lot, and it's a big picture idea that really includes all the migration. So it's the movement of immigrants and slaves, uh, all the trade, uh, the spreading of disease. This all falls under, under the banner of Columbian Exchange. So this exchange really brought together four continents, uh, North America, South America, Eurasia, and Africa, all into one big trading network. And this network was driven by the wealth from the Americas, and Europeans own that wealth. Uh, so on top of the crops, this wealth came from uh, sugar plantations, cotton plantations, uh, silver mines. So, you know, these new lucrative industries, they helped shift the power balance uh, of the world away from the Indian Ocean and move it towards Europe. 